Mark Torian, welcome to Talking the Talk. How are you doing today? Good, really good. Thank you for the invite. How are you? Well, thank you for uh, for doing this. I'm doing great. And like I, like I said earlier, I've been a fan since the debut album came out in 88. I was in ninth grade. And I just remember the first time the needle hit the grooves and Hard as a Rock came on. And I just knew I was listening to something that was different from a lot of the peers of you guys. You know, like... It was something about it, like it was gritty, yet it was. It still had that kind of sleaze to it, but it was also kind of like gnarly, if that makes sense. There was no balance. Yeah, no, no absolutely. That's a per- perfect word for it. Thank you. <laughs> I mean, in like all respect, you know, like it was, yeah. it was a very gnarly sound because I remember going like, like this is not bubblegum. Um, you know, we had a really punk and roll sound, and mm. I, and I. You know, I use that. I use that word. It's kind of a made-up word to me because it's, um, you know, we weren't rock and roll. We weren't, you know, we were we were really different. It's and still are. You know, we kind of. Uh, uh, I just want to say one thing before we carry on, though. I love the analogy of you saying when the needle hit the vinyl. Oh. <laughs> or the needle. The needle hit the groove. That mm-hmm. is so rad. Thank you for saying that. Well, I'll be honest. It's not a lie because I actually still have the debut album, like the vinyl. You know, awesome. and so like I remember no, I ripping vinyl. the cellophane off and big, putting the needle on. Yes. It just it blew big my mind. Vinyl guy here, absolutely. Well, so where did that sound actually come from? Because you guys used to get pegged a lot, some you know, for like being this kind of Van Halen thing. But I honestly, aside from you know your charismatic you know like live presence i never really heard much of that i heard more of a kind of a street vibe we have between the, the four original guys we we have different musical tastes but yet the same musical taste mm-hmm. and i believe the sound came from basically from where where we started the band which was in carson california in uh, lonnie vincent's uh, mom's garage her house um <laughs> and also to the the unconventional way we basically came up the ranks here in la um we never wanted to be a hollywood band per se and never really were uh we came out of the south bay out of carson california um we were very stalwart at not wanting to play the sunset strip but mm-hmm. to play off the sunset strip so our home actually became the Troubadour, which is one, probably one of the first places we played in Hollywood. Mm-hmm. But most of the time we were playing, you know, off places. And then we played a place uh, a few times called the Dancing Waters Club in San Pedro. I don't mm-hmm. know if it's there still, but, you know, we, we were playing all these really eclectic different places. Uh, you know, um, one of our first shows, I mean, that I can think of was at a, um, was in Huntington Beach. Uh, at a place called Perks, right on right on Main Street in Huntington Beach. So uh, we only knew five songs, but uh, we played our five songs, and we're like, okay, cool, everybody loved it. And the guys that brought us out there, uh, at the, who brought us to the gig, um, one of them being our friend Lenny Mazzotti, uh, that owned a restaurant called Mazzotti's at the time, he was like, I don't care how many songs, play those five again. <laughs> That's this, that was basically like our first show, you know, it's really, you know, just real bare bones. And, um, you know, we've always had this very aggressive live sound for four guys. Um, that's, you know, that has a lot of different influences that are involved, but you know, our, some of our big, big, biggest influences, we never really get to chat about, which was, just, you know, some of the old school stuff that we used to listen to and uh, some of the aggressiveness that we brought and the sound of it was, has has a lot to do with the, the individual players in the band and, mm-hmm. you know, the way they um, had, to, you know, the way they would bring the style or, or that, you know, feeling. And I think it all starts with just the, the four of us, the, the attitude that we had that we needed to be different than all the other bands in mm-hmm. some way so we could... Um, so we could have our time to shine, you know? Yeah, so, you know, like I said, one of the things I loved so much about the debut was that it just didn't sound like anything else, but yet it was still, you know, easy easy to grasp, you know what I mean? And Right. And and it was the absence of 
the ballad that one of the things that yes. you know appealed to me now like at any point especially during the first uh album was there some pressure from the label because at the time the you know the power ballad was huge i mean everybody oh had gosh, one yeah. you know so like were you guys at any time like pressured into trying to do one and you guys just had to stand your ground and say fuck no yeah in, you know pretty much uh we were very very blessed that we had uh, our pseudo fifth member, our producer, Ted Templeman. Um, we were signed by Ted and Roberta Peterson, mm-hmm. Roberta Peterson. Te- it was Ted Temple's Templeman's sister and God rest her soul. May she rest in peace. She was our angel over Warner brothers. And, you know, Ted really wanted us to do what we wanted to do. Mm-hmm. Um, and one of the things that we were just vehemently against was doing a ballad because everybody was doing it. And we didn't want to be known as this ballad rock and roll band that was jumping on bandwagons just so we could have a ballad. And, and everybody did one from that time. I mm-hmm. think we're one of the only bands, or one of the few bands that never did that on our first record. So well, you didn't it, was do it, on your first record? it was very challenging for us at the time because of the fact that we didn't have that. So. Right. Uh, everybody always asks, well, you guys never did a ballad. You know, did you do a ballad? I go, yeah, we did a ballad. It was called Smooth Up. <laughs> <laughs> it's a slow, sexy, dirgy ballad. You know, it's, you know, it's like some people are like, oh, come on, dude. You know, it's like, come on now. But I don't know. You know, you know F sharp nine is I, I pretty think, is pretty romantic. <laughs> yeah, right. You know, talking about the perils of being growing up here in Los Angeles, you know, so. <laughs> Uh, but no, you know, thank you for saying that. I think it, um, I always go back and, and, and not to be, um, how would you say out of all humility, I always like to think of us for as one of the only bands that didn't do that to actually quote unquote sell out Mm -hmm. to become famous. And it had its drawbacks also though, too, because, you know, we had to work harder, um, because we didn't do that. And a lot of the bands at that time that were able to, to, you know, I hear all these songs, you know, some of these bands, um, we just got off the MR, um, Monsters of Rock Cruise. Mm -hmm. And uh, a lot of these bands, you know, they have these beautiful ballads. And, you know, one of the, one of the ballads that came out of that time, that's, uh, you know, and I love ballads. Mm -hmm. Um, I'm not really a fond uh, lover of ballads from the bands from our genre, mm-hmm. but I'm more of a seventies ballad guy, you know, seventies bands and what have you. But the other day we're sitting on the side of the stage and, um, extreme was on stage and they were playing more than words. <laughs> and, and I turned around to Lonnie, <laughs> I turned around to Lonnie he goes, I don't say it. <laughs> <laughs> I go, what? He goes, I know what you're going to say, bro. And I'm thinking the same thing. I said, but I, let me tell you something. That's a beautiful song, but thank God we didn't do it because that, that makes us stand out. He goes, no, you're right. I well, go, but it would have been, it would be nice to link, you know, all the supermarkets we go into and CVSs <laughs> and what have you. And more than words comes on. He goes, okay, stop it. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so we're going, you know, <clears throat> that song, out of all the ballads that that I've heard from different bands, to me, I'll always be in somewhere like a CVS or what have you, or or Ralph's or what have you, or on the road or something, and that song comes on, and I'm sitting there, and I stop what I'm doing, and I go, I just gotta call Muno and tell him how much I love him. <laughs> well, you know, and that's the thing. That's the best thing about being an artist is sometimes you know you you can look to other people's material and admire it. And respect them for it, but then you don't have to have that attitude or the mentality of you know right. what I should. Well, when it do first that. came, when it first came out, I was like, "Are you kidding me?" It's <laughs> like you know, like when we were young, it's like, "What is going on here?" You know, we're all hard, and what are they guys? What are these guys doing? You know, and then you know, you listen to it now. It's just such a beautiful song. It just it it um, you know they painted with broad strokes back then, and you know we're we're not thinking about that. But I was just like, mm-hmm. still now, you know. I, I was listening to the song and then, and, you know, I'm, I'm a huge Nuno fan. I, mm-hmm. I, I just love him with all my heart. He's a, an amazing, amazing person. Forget the musician, but just the person. He has so much love in his heart. And mm-hmm. we've been friends for many years. And, you know, Gary, amazing, you know, just up there doing his thing. And, 
and I'm listening to them sing and stuff, and I'm going like, wow, man, this is such a, this is, kudos for them for doing the song, because it would have never been done if someone, if they didn't both of those guys and say, let's do like a, um, um, how would you say, um, a different type of ballad. Mm-hmm. You know, let's just do something that's a little bit more, you know, on a, on a softer side. But anyway, not sorry, I'm getting a little bit worried about it, but... No, no, no. You know, a lot no, of the ballads that the guys came came out with back in the day, of course, one of the first ones, I believe, was Motley Crue's Home Sweet Home. Mm-hmm. So that kind of set the precedent for, for everything. And uh, we, the only ballad that I think was even close to any ballad, but it was more of a bebop type of song um, that we did on Zaza was a song called Mine. Yes. And uh, that was written by Mick Sueda. And at the time, when, when we were getting ready to do it, you know, <clears throat> Mick brought the song up, and, you know, I, I fell in love with it, you know, because mm-hmm. it was so old school and from another era that it was it, it was a beautiful song, and I really, we really wanted to do it. So that's one of the only things I think it, that we have as a ballad Mm-hmm. or close to it. Um, but that's, you know, that's one of my favorite songs on the Zaza record that we had at the time that we, the four of us, you know, all agreed and said, you know what, man, this is just such a great song. And, and Ted loved it. So we were, we got to, we got to work on this, man. This is really, and it came out really, really amazing. So I love ballads and stuff and I love to sing ballads, but I, I think I'm more of an R and B type of ballad guy. Mm-hmm. Um, I come from the R and B school, uh, soul music and, and what have you. Um, Hell, you did a, I would be more, a funk band on Motown, man. You know, I mean, that yeah, says a whole man. lot. You know? I, I'll be more into doing, you know, something. I think we would be more into trying to do something different like that, but I think we were very, very fortunate from the music that we put out that we were able to sustain our career and to be out there, but we worked so hard, man. We were constantly out there. I mean, well, you know, we a lot were, of that came two. from, I mean, a lot of that came through your songs, though. You know what I mean? Like, I mean, even on the first album, yeah, sure. you know, you're talking like, you know, you know, Ode to Joe, you're telling you, yeah, Shoot the right. Preacher Down, you know, e- yes. even as something kind of like, kind of grungy as, you know, Hell on My Heels, you know, I mean, like, oh, that, yeah. that was one of the things that, that always appealed to me, you know, from the, you know, especially that early Bullet Boys material was that. It never felt boring. It never felt like you were doing the same song constantly. Yes. I mean, we, we were definitely not about trying to do the same record or the same song all the time. And I think that definitely made us um, a different band. And, and to be honest with you, that our first record still stands the test of time. Oh, absolutely. All these years. And it's it's the, uh, the love that we put into it, but also the love of our producer and the way it was structured. Um, we did it in two weeks. All of it was live. Jesus. We were very, very well rehearsed and we came in there and, you know, and just, and just, you know, kicked ass and, and blew the doors off and blew the roof off the place with the stuff. And Ted was, you know, just let us do our thing and be, uh, be us. And, um, and it was really the magical, extremely magical experience, especially working with Ted Templeman, who is, who is our guy, who's, you know, uh, who, who basically, you know, we had the sound and he came in and multiplied that sound to make it, to make it even bigger. Mm -hmm. So he really taught us a lot of things of space and, um, and how to achieve, um, the bigness in, in, in the music and simplify it and to, to make it more accessible. Um, and would always give us some type of homework or book to read or movie to watch (laughs) <laughs> you know, that would spur us to think of other things and to, you know, to come up with new and fresh ideas. Um, but this, our second record, Freak Show, was a complete turnaround from what we did on our first record. Oh, and we were absolutely so, so excited about it, you know, because like you just said, going back to what you said, everybody was putting out the same record every time. Same sound. Song sounded the same. So I, I don't, you know, the, we were just that band that didn't want to, how would you say um, be that cookie cutter type of um, musical group? Yes, exactly. And, you know, and actually you were talking about um, just, you know, we were talking about just the versatility of the songs. One of the things that, at least from the first album before, you know, I get into uh, Freak Show was, you know, F Sharp 9 off of the debut. Like, for one, that is 
one of the coolest songs, but it's also of of the era, I should say. But it's played in like the oddest of keys. You know what I mean? Like that was like yes. nothing. Yeah. Like, you know, how did that one come around? And because also lyrically, like there's some pretty, there's some shit in there that even in, in ninth grade I didn't quite understand. And you know, now no, at 46, I'm going, oh, me- you know, Mephistopheles. That's kind of cool. You know what I mean? So <laughs> I had no we idea what Mephistopheles was in ninth grade. Yeah. You know. <laughs> You know, we we always try to paint pictures, and uh, we always painted with. We still to this day paint with broad strokes. So lyrically, it was, um, you know, it's it's basically basically the song talking about the perils of of life in general, with growing up here in L.A. and being in the business. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think that you know, lyrically, everything had. Um, Everything had its congruency. Every song had its congruency on that first record that kind of told the story uh, from the first song all the way through. You know, so uh, F sharp nine is probably, you know, one of the most difficult songs I think that we, we attempted because of the time changes and, and the way the way that song moves, mm-hmm. uh, you know, the chorus, you know, uh, it, it just, it's, it's not your normal choruses that you know those how would you say those um cookie cutter choruses a lot of the bands had right we had more of a thinking chorus you know? <laughs> well, <laughs> I, was, so, I don't know how else to explain it you know well you know uh, i always thought that like it was musically you know much more dynamic than you know many of you know whereas like you know you would have like a, a verse chorus verse chorus verse chorus maybe sometimes throw a bridge in there or something you know but mm-hmm. like that whole section that goes into the guitar solo when it totally just becomes oh, a yeah. whole different song. I was just like, you know, I don't know. I've got friends of mine that are going like, dude, I can't believe you're like artistically, you know, breaking down the Bullet Boys, dude. But you know, <laughs> you know. But I'm like, this is a oh, great I applaud fucking you band. for that. Thank you for doing so. <laughs> Absolutely. You know, I was, are you kidding me? Oh, I was just having a conversation with my friend today. I said, look, dude. I was like, I'm not gonna lie, man. Those first three Bullet Boys in my heart, those first three albums are like flawless from like front to back. And there's this so much diversity and just some great i mean everything just felt like really thought out and like Mm. even like thc groove like when that song Mm. when i saw i saw the world premiere of that video on mt on headbangers ball when it came out and i just remember going it sounds like the bullet boys but it's way darker you know (laughs) this is like Mm -hmm. a really dark song and you guys were also kind of touching on the whole like marijuana thing when it was still very taboo and it wasn't even kind of hit right. so we had a hard time releasing smooth up when it first came out because mm-hmm. the, the the original title title was smooth up in ya. so <laughs> the the uh, radio programmers got this the first thing they told our label was we can't play this <laughs> the ti- first of all the title you know and the song oh my gosh you know, this is a great song, but we we can't do that. So I think when it all, I, I don't remember exactly how it all, how it, how it was all entailed, but um, we had to change the title mm-hmm. to smooth up. Yeah. And all of a sudden they're playing it. Right. So, and you know, we, we had a lot of controversy with some of the stuff that we released. Um, smooth up was a tough one. Um, and then we would go, you know, well, what, they can play slide it in. What's what, but you know why? Why can't they play smooth up? You exactly know, right. It was a play on words, and you know it was very sexy, but naughty, but but not uh, just hit you over the head sexually type of thing. It know? wasn't graphic. So, you know, it was. Yeah, you know, it, it, it was, was a understated. Cool sex, sex and tune, and but you know, eventually got played, and Warner Brothers put their foot down, and you know, and it became a huge hit. Um, the other one was uh, you know THC Groove. That was you know people like okay. It's it's called the THC groove. I mean, really? (laughs) (laughs) Which, by the way, I have to say, is one of the greatest stoner rock songs ever. (laughs) Totally, right? I just totally Uh, love that. And we were just talking about what we dealt with with people in the business. Mm -hmm. And at that point, on our second record, uh, we all had chips on our shoulders. And sometimes I think people took kindness for weakness with us. And we just said, you know what? The second record, we're not following anything. We're just going to do what we do. And if people like it, great. If we don't, our, our thing is, Ted loved it and we loved it. We're good. 
Mm -hmm. (laughs) You know, Roberta loved it. Warner's loved it. They just let us do our thing to basically like Van Halen. So different times and, you know, it wasn't always, you know, you guys need to, you guys need to hit, write a hit, like smooth up again. And we weren't trying to do that. So Mm -hmm. on the second record also, we did a cover. Uh, the first record we did a cover of For the Love of Money, which mm-hmm. was very, very successful for us and uh, uh, really changed the the, uh, the landscape of rock bands, of, of, of what what we were and what other bands were. Mm-hmm. So on the second record, Ted, Ted approached us with three different songs to do to do a cover. And, and it, we were not wanting to do covers. Right. We, we were very weird about it. Like, we thought we can't do a cover. Why are we doing, you know, blah, blah, blah. But we learned also by doing the covers, by changing the song and bringing it into a different, oh, uh, what'd you say? Um, uh, a, 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 diff, a, a different a different way of singing or playing the song that was already written. So kind of modifying John it, Hanks basically. Chris, yeah. Right, right, right. So in, in, on Hang and St. Christopher... We had three different songs that we demoed out, and um, I, I believe that one of them was "Give Me Shelter." The other one was uh, Season, "Season of the Witch," and the third one was "Hang on St. Christopher." Wow! So Ted brought those to our attention, and uh, we we demoed them up. And when it all came down to it, "Hang on St. Christopher" uh, was just amazing. And mixed guitar, the way, what he did with his you know, that first trip, uh-huh. I mean, no one was doing <laughs> shit like that. You know? And then we heard that. And we're like, oh, that's it. You know? So we're big Tom Waits fans and all that stuff. So uh, that whole, that whole thing came in through. And, you know, a lot, there's some musicians to this day um, that loved our band and then said, you know, when you guys did that, I, I'm not a fan of your band anymore. So I never understood that. But really? That's one of the my, Hang On St. Yeah, Christopher really, cover? Really weird. But other other musicians were like, I hated your band before, and I love you guys now because you did that song. <laughs> yeah, so. I actually played that song for, for an old friend of mine years ago who was like a huge Tom Waits fan, and I was like, you got to hear this. And he was like, no fucking way, dude. The Bullet Boys cover Tom Waits. I'm like, dude, listen to the song. And he was like, Okay, that was fucking badass. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like he was like, but one of the things I loved about it was that, like you said, like you kind of just took took that song, like if and if I wouldn't have known better, I wouldn't have known that it was a cover. Like the only reason I even knew right. it was a cover when I was when I had the album was by looking at the liner notes and saw that it was written by right. someone other than you. So you know, whatever you did, you put that spin on it. You know, which I kind of thought what you guys did with For the Love of Money as well. And I feel like that's important Absolutely. when you're doing a If you're going to do a cover song, you need to do it right and do it your way so that it can mesh with your original stuff. No, absolutely. That's what we were doing. And um, for all intents and purposes, you know, there was no band at the time that would ever attempt to try to put or redo For the Love of Money by, by you know, by the OJs. Right. When we put that song on a record, people thought that we wrote that song. They had no idea that it was that it was what it was. I didn't know that the o, that was an OJ song that the OJs wrote it. And uh, when we sent it to the OJs, they loved it. They were so they wrote us a letter and congratulating us on the song. Uh, but That's hang on, awesome. Christopher, we actually had to put a chorus to the song because in in. Christopher, there, there actually isn't, uh, in the original version, there is not a chorus. Right. So in our version, we use the uh, the three three words, let, let him ride. ride. Yeah. Let yeah. Him ride. And we, we stacked those and made this really eerie um, uh, harmony with it that that finalized the, the whole thing. You know, let him ride, let him ride. Mm-hmm. And that really brought the song into fruition for us. And th- that was all helped by our illustrious producer, Mr. Ted Templeman. Well, you know, I mean, y- you know, it was such a great song. And like, again, you know, we're talking about doing, you know, we like we were just touching on doing like variations of your songs. I 
to this day and i've got i've got the most ridiculous memory like i remember shit that most people wouldn't but then i can't remember what i had for breakfast yesterday but like <laughs> i said like this is how my brain works but right? you guys were on headbangers ball one time and it was right around the time thc groove was out and the whole band was in the studio and you guys did this acoustic set where Jimmy was playing like a giant water bottle, like jug thing yeah. that came out the water cooler, you know, and he was playing that and, you know, and uh, Mick and Lonnie had acoustic instruments and y'all were just killing it. Like, and I just remember thinking that was like the coolest fucking thing ever. Like, have you guys ever considered doing like a show like that or maybe even an album? Because I thought it was just a brilliant presentation, to be honest. That was one of my favorites. To, uh, thank you for bringing that up. Uh, yeah, you know, I I think we all would love to do something like that. You know, um, it, it, it was something that uh, that was done in the spur of the moment, I believe, mm -hmm. and uh, we didn't really quite plan it. Um, but it all came it all came into fruition the way it was supposed to come, and we pulled it off, and it was sounded amazing. You know, it's funny because I was, I just interviewed Richie Kotzen yesterday and we were just oh. talking about just the craft of songs, you know, and one of the mm. things he said, because I, you know, as a songwriter myself, I totally agree with this, is he said mm. a great song should be able to be completely stripped down to an acoustic guitar. And if it can be played Absolutely. and can be presented that way, then it's a great song. And yeah, of course, a lot of people, I'm sure, especially my friends are going to listen to this and go, boy, you're laying it on thick, dude. But like, there's a reason why I'm a Bullet Boys fan. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, because yeah. that to me was such a great representation of your ability as a band to say, you know what? These songs are fucking good. It, he, he's absolutely right. If you can't play a song acoustic, uh, it, it, it should be it, it, a great song. It's a great song no matter what you play, what, uh, whatever instrument you play it on. I mean, if you even if you're gonna be playing on a fucking water jug, you know, what I mean, come on, yeah, dude. you know what I mean. I mean, it looked like he had uh -huh. made it right before you guys started, you know, which <laughs> you probably did. Hey, if you can play it on a kazoo, you're doing great. <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't really want to hear smooth up on a kazoo, but I'll take your word for it, man. Yeah, hey, man, kazoos are in style right now, baby. <laughs> That's the one instrument you don't really want to make a comeback, like like that and the trumpet, you know what I mean? Or the banjo, I should say. You know? Oh, my gosh. Stop it. I love it. Well, so I'm so unconventional. I'll try anything once. I don't know, but we can do like a bluegrass tribute to the Bullet Boys, you know? we can. I mean, we can yes, make this sir. happen, man. Come on, you know? <laughs> Well, you know what? You guys had some like fucking amazing tours back in the day. And I remember like, especially for the first album cycle, at least the, the two that I can remember, like you guys, you guys did the Aussie tour for uh, No Rest for the Wicked. Then you guys were on the Cinderella bill, with Cinderella and Winger and Bullet Boys. And then mm -hmm. carrying over into Freak Show, you guys, you guys did a whole summer with uh, Poison and Slaughter. Um, yes. Is there a specific tour of all the ones that you did that you look back on and you go, that was by far my favorite? Wow, that's a good question. I think the best, man, you know, the, the tours that we did with, with, with everybody in Poison and, and Ozzy and Cinderella were just amazing. But I would say when we first came out, it wasn't really my favorite tour, but it was the tour that I think that really where we found ourselves out there on the road mm -hmm. and where we really hunkered down and and really got serious about our performances and what, the way we sound and how tight we were. And that would be our first tour, which was with, we, we were out with uh, Ian Hunter Ian and Hunter, Mick yeah. Ronson. That, that was our first tour, the Ian Hunter-Ronson Hunter tour. So, um, the greatest thing about that is that we got to talk with Nick Ronson every night. And I'm a huge David Bowie fan A uh, David Bowie. I just, I, that's my guy. So <laughs> when amazing. we were able to hang out with Nick Ronson and talk with him every night and talk about David Bowie and, you know, and sit there and have cocktails with him. And he was so sweet and so kind to us. But on the other hand, <laughs> Ian Hunter despised us. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. <laughs> so, so he was not about us at all. We're these young punks. 
you know, killing it, number one on MTV, and he was not feeling us. <laughs> so there'd be times where we'd be opening up for them, and people were like, boo, fucking get out of here. We were just like, what the fuck? Fuck y'all. We're here. We're not going anywhere. You know? So we were, you know, we just, we had chips on our shoulders. We were then we were very, you know, we didn't care who we played with. We were going to get out there and destroy you. Well, get that, ready. Well, that was the so whole team, Nick Ross right? loved that about us. You know, he was oh, like, yeah. fuck, you guys are my guys, you know, fuck yeah. And so I think that first tour that really brought us together as a band and really what we started doing different things and changes and segues and, and our music and got really tight as a unit. We were in a, we were in a broken down RV that was freezing. <laughs> so, so it was very difficult, but I think that was probably one of my favorites. I, I can't speak for the rest of the fellas, but for me, I still hold that very dear in my heart. I mean, that sounds like a great tour to, you know, I mean, like, kind of like what you said, like, you know, kind of cutting your teeth, you know what I mean? And like, yes. kind of just being like, you know, this is where you kind of learned to kind of roll with the punches, how to deal with an audience that maybe yep. didn't like you and, and kind of push forward For and sure. things like that, you know? Well, um, shit, we, all, we got, we almost got booed off stage when we played with Ozzy because they wanted, they wanted, they wanted Ozzy Osbourne up there. They didn't want to have anything to do with us. <laughs> Let me tell you what. I, I actually bought the paper. Uh, uh, actually, I didn't. My parents did. Bought the pay-per-view show that was uh, you guys and Ozzy at the Tower Theater in Philadelphia. Um, yes. And like, I was just watching that on YouTube earlier this morning to kind of prep for the interview. And one of the things I just love the fact is that you guys were definitely one of those bands, which in, in, in this aspect was pretty popular with bands back then, where it was like very much a take no prisoners kind of thing. You know, yeah, like absolutely. like you would go Still out on day. stage in front of an audience and regardless of what your the reaction you got was, you just would just continue to go on and just play your ass yes. off. I mean, I saw that in a lot of bands. What was it about that era? Because I don't think you see that a whole lot now, but what was it about it back then that bands were just so fucking hungry to just go out there and just be like, you know, here it is. And if you don't like it, you know, open wide, you can get it anyway. I, I, <laughs> you know? I don't think all bands were like that. There were, there were a handful of bands like that. I would mm -hmm. say us, Guns N' Roses, Faster Pussycat. LA Guns. Mm -hmm. um, we, you know, we just had a certain way of we did things, and we're from LA. Mm -hmm. And when you're born and raised in LA, you kind of don't take shit from anybody. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's you know, about right. That's, yeah, that's the attitude that you have. I was born and raised here. You know, we worked very hard, and no matter what people, you know, the, the whole Tower Theater thing was it was uh, it just the place was full of Bullet Boys fans. I mean, crazy. But when you're playing with you know, a legend like Ozzy Osbourne, and we 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 don't we didn't care who we were playing with. We were going to just go and do our thing. It didn't matter. Mm -hmm. So when we got that reaction from the crowd, the first thing all of us thought was like, "Fuck! If you don't like it, get the fuck out!" Right? <laughs> <laughs> you know, and and that's that punk rock thing, attitude in us, and that thing that we just you know, whether people liked it or not, we were just like that. You know, we were, here we are, we're doing our thing. And and still, that's one of the most infamous shows we've ever played. Oh, yeah. I mean, because one of the things I also loved about it was that it was so fucking punchy that, like, before you mm. could even figure out if you liked them or not, you were three songs deep, man. <laughs> you know what I mean? Because you were just like, <laughs> <laughs> which I love that, you know, because I, I, you know, like, you know, I always tell this joke about how, you know, I went and saw the Ramones once and I was yes, up against the barricade. And right when they came out and opened up with Teenage Lobotomy, someone flipped me over the oh. barricade. And, you know, right. when you get flipped over, they walk you to the back of the venue. Well, when I got back, to the venue they were on their eighth song i was like what the fuck <laughs> dude they did 38 yes, songs sir. in an hour and 15 minutes i'm like good fucking god you know what i mean but like that's what i loved about shows like that you know like especially like with that tower theater show i felt like you just went one into the other and the other and before anyone could really not like you you were like shit they're almost done <laughs> you know what I mean? which i thought yeah, was great no absolutely and, and we're kind of like that still you know we're 
we we feel if we're doing okay and we're playing for each other on stage, mm-hmm. that's the most important thing for us. What comes out of it and what we do, we're we're definitely a performance band. No tapes, no no samples, no, nothing like that. It's all pure rock and roll, mm-hmm. real rock and roll. So you know that's how we kind of stayed and and uh, for all intents and purposes. I really believe that's the way rock and roll should be played. No, I, t- I totally agree. I totally agree. And, you know, like I said, like I was, you know, I was a fan all the way, you know, first album, second album, Zaza came out, 93, fucking loved it. And then all of a sudden there was this kind of a break. Things kind of fell apart. And like mm. at that point, I kind of, you guys kind of fell off my radar and gotcha. your music kind of fell off my radar. But like, like most bands do, you know what I mean? Like, like if you, you know, I have the attention span of a, you know, a stick of butter, you know? So I mean, like if it's not right. like right in my face, you know, if, if there's mm. like more than like two years or something, it just, you know, something else comes in. Now right. I have since gone back and revisited some of the, you know, the the post you know Zaza albums and right. not a lot of it really most of it didn't really click with me and like when you hear something like that are you cool with that or does that make you like want to kick my ass <laughs> you know, like, no, I'm sorry say that again was it so, most of the stuff that came out post Zaza even though I went back and listened to it like it didn't really click with right. me you know and like you know I didn't oh, hate God. it but I was like ah this isn't my thing you know so like if you hear an old fan say something like that, like does that kind of piss you off, or do, or are you just no. kind of like, oh, okay, you know? No, not not at all. To be quite honest with you, I don't think that uh, our Zaza record was one of our favorites. I, I, I like again, I'm not speaking for the rest of the fellows, but mm-hmm. that wasn't really one of my favorites. We were going through a very tumultuous time mm-hmm. uh, when we were creating that record. Um, it wasn't necessarily some of the stuff that I wanted to do, but mm-hmm. but. In retrospect, listening to the record now, in fact, we have conversations before with us all the time, and I'm going, God dang it, I heard Crosstop the other day, Mick. What What's going on with that? And he goes, I know, right? Like, we're like, you know, so like, we, we're listening back to some of the stuff and go, wow, that was really good. What oh, that was thinking, a, it know? was a great fucking record, but um, was it, that was a great album, you know, but then like, like and a, here's, yeah. Here's the thing, real quick, and not to interrupt you, I apologize. But oh, no, 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 go ahead. Here's, here's a band like Bullet Boys playing with Living Color. Here's a band like Bullet Boys playing with Bad Brains. Here's a band, you know what I'm saying? Like, right. we were playing with bands that weren't from our genre even back then, because that's what we wanted to do. And, and you know, it really worked out for us because we did a lot of our, the majority of our touring through the 90s. And I still consider us not an 80s band, but more of a 90s band because we were so different and not this cookie cutter uh, rock and roll band. Well, you guys were just right on that cusp, you know, I mean, like, I mean, like that yeah, out, sure. the first album came out, what, 88? And then you guys were on yeah. the road, 89? And then you're talking about going into, you know, so, I mean, it was so close that a lot of those bands that kind of came out in that era kind of crossed into the 90s where I felt like it was kind of leaving behind the 80s but not quite all the way into the late 90s so it was like it was just like right. mid, it was like this middle chapter you know what i mean that right. just kind of started and right like for instance going back to THC groove right our first single off our second record no one would try to attempt that you know the, everybody, everybody back then was trying to rewrite the song that made them famous on their first record mm-hmm. so i i i might be speaking out of turn, but that's what I felt at the time. So for us to come out with the good, 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 the to my excitement, it was a big news, obviously, and to a lot of Bullet Boys fans, was that you guys reunited last year, you know, towards the end of the year, and did this incredible show. 
You know, Yay! and it made, I, I know it was like, it was like, it was like the shot heard around the world, you know? And like, yes, sir. it was one of those things that made me think about, you know, there's so many people, like so many of my idols and people I just loved are just dying left and right. And life is just too fucking short to carry grudges and whatnot. Man, is, is, is that the mentality that brought the bullet boys back together that brought you guys together? To try you know, this the, again. The, what brought us back together, bro, was the love for each other. Mm -hmm. This was started with love. This was not um, uh, anything other than that. Uh, we had to find a way to have to find congruency with the way we are now from the way we were back in the day. Mm -hmm. And you know, I, I'm pers personally, I'm not the same person I was back in the day. I, I've, I've had a lot of growth. Um, I lead with love, patience, understanding, and, and forgiveness. Um, a lot different than I did back in the day when I was drinking and using. Mm -hmm. So um, we are at a very, we are at a, a certain point with all of our, us as individuals, as people uh, that are leading with a lot of love. And we got together for not only for the love of ourselves, but for the love of the old music that we created together. But that we have a lot of unfinished musical business with each other um, that we haven't been able to walk across that threshold of that. So where other bands have, and we're the only band as of right now that really has all original members in it other than Motley or Aerosmith and um, wow, you know, that's but actually, for bands at the time. Yeah, but I mean. It is, it is a huge labor of love. And we kind of have to be a little bit selfish because sometimes when bands get together, they start thinking of other things and other people and we're doing it for this and we're doing it for that. And I, I think it really comes down to that, you know, magical four letter word of L O V E, which mm -hmm. we changed into L U F F, which is love, which is more than love. <laughs> I so love that. <laughs> Jimmy came up with, Jimmy came up with that word and we're kind of using that hashtagging love because people ask that, well, how, how did you guys do this and how did this happen? Because out of all bands, as volatile as the four of us all are, no one was expecting this, and we really wanted to surprise people with it. So we've been working and talking for months and finding a, um, a place where we can all be comfortable in and mm -hmm. to come and start. We're working actually, actually today. I'm at, after this interview, I'm headed over to Mix House. We're, we're working on a new record right now. Oh, so, I love it. That's beautiful, yeah, man. It's, it's unbelievable, man. It's just so magical. And I, I can't even explain it to you. Um, it's, it's been great, um, you know, getting out these ideas. I've written a lot of material for this new record. Um, mm -hmm. The fellows have, also have material written. So we're kind of sorting through things. And uh, we're working on things as we speak. We had a huge meeting last night um, with our new manager, who is Larry Morand. And, oh uh, yeah, who it, it works with poison and whatnot? Yeah, yes. So um, we're with Union Entertainment with Larry Morant, and uh, and we're very we're such a blessing. And uh, he knows where we want to go, and he knows that we have the ability to do that. So him coming into our world has just been nothing but a blessing for for all four of us involved. Um, and that you know we. Uh, did our appearance, of course. We did our first show at the Whiskey, and our second show was right uh, on the MOR cruise. Mm -hmm. We were the secret sail away band. We had to, you know, hide and come on with masks on the boat, be the last <laughs> ones on the boat. <laughs> we got up there, you know, performed. Even the equipment wasn't really checked out or anything. We, we just went out there and, and, you know, just destroyed the seven seas, man. It was mm -hmm. such a exhilarating, epic performance by all of us that we just, you know, but, no one knows how anything like that's going to go. You never know. You know, right. no sound check, blah, 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 blah. But people were remarking on how tight the band is. How are you guys so tight after not playing with each other for all these years? We just don't understand it. Mm -hmm. How is that possible? It's kind of like riding and, a bike. Yeah. It, it, and, you know, it's, it's a really hard thing to explain, mm -hmm. but there's just something about the four of us that when we play we don't there's just this dichotomy that we have that enables us to just jump into the thing like we never left and i don't know what it is but it's just something that we have that 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 we're very blessed to have 
So I'll be honest, like someone like me who, you know, was I'm way on the other side of the country when you guys were fucking playing the whiskey. I went back, you know, scouring YouTube days after to see if somebody recorded it. And when I watched it, one of the things that stuck out to me the most was the chemistry. The chemistry was Mm -hmm. there every Mm -hmm. bit as it was when I saw you guys, you know, you know, with poison. And when I saw you guys on the Zaza tour, like it's like it's exactly what you said. Like, it just looks like it's supposed to be. It even sounds like it too. Is that it's just supposed to be? It's it's real, bro. It's not it's not uh, contrived. Uh, it's real love for each other on stage and real admiration for each other on stage. To know that there's strength in numbers, and you know, I've been I've been doing this on my own for ten years without the guys, mm-hmm. um, with myself, Nick Ross, Chad McDonald, um, and we've done tons of touring, been all over the world. But mm-hmm. you know. You just get that craw, that that thing that's sitting in you, and you're going, you know, man, we we have unfinished business. We we never got to do what we wanted to do, the four of us. And I think we're all grown, um, and be able to have this opportunity to to do this. You you can't turn something like that down. There's just too much. Um, uh, how would you say it? the um, t- anticipation and um, feelings inside? Like, wow, you know that. I, we can really do this again and this mm-hmm. sounds incredible and just the fact that you know we're all chatting with each other and, and having a blast doing it you know and working hard on the business end and then finding ways to hang to out at sure each other's houses and time. stuff and write yeah, songs man, together I mean, like it was you know I, I mean i you know we we've been talking about it and talking about it but i gotta tell you you know when it all came down to it it was girl power um our three wives who are beautiful amazing women in our lives uh, who we revere and have so much respect for individually, they were able to come down and sit down and have a parlay to help us to get this thing together. So when when I when you have to give credit where credit is due, I I always give you know uh, Drew, Shelley, and Lorraine the, the topmost credit because they're the ones that actually were, could see the potential and, and got us through a difficult time to make us all realize that we need to do this and that we can do this and it can be better than it was before. Yeah. And that says a lot when somebody, when somebody from, you know, that says a lot when, you know, a loved one can kind of look, you know, from the outside, look, look in and say, I can tell there's some emptiness here. Like you guys need to just, do whatever you need to do to get this working again so that you can complete or at least carry on the task. Right. Right. Exactly. And and listen, nothing's easy in this world. It isn't. But when you have four individuals like us, myself, Jimmy, Lai, and Mick, there's things that you have to, you know, you have to sort through to get to, to get to that point. Mm -hmm. And once you're able to do that, you're in an op- you're in a in an open you're in a, the middle of the ocean and there's no waves and you're right. you, you you're sailing through these beautiful waters and you're able to speak to each other and you're able to get things done with love not with stress <laughs> and i think that's the big key with us getting back together and doing what we're doing and having this amazing village behind us and you know it, it's you are what your village is and you are what you know, the people that you have around you that, uh, that are, uh, guiding, guiding you and, and helping you in your journey to, uh, be successful, uh, musically and mm-hmm. successful in life. So I'd like to give credit where credit's due and, um, our new agency, uh, ARM, uh, with John Domigo has been amazing. <laughs> Larry Moran, amazing. Just everybody that we have in our lives right now, I, I have huge thank yous for and, and, um, just uh, a lot of love. Well, Mark, this was awesome talking to you, but I have to say I've got a few questions for you. And I always like to ask these questions to people, especially when I really feel like I've connected with them because they're just fun questions. And I'm always curious. Okay. These are the kind of questions I used to wish I could ask, you know, when I wanted to be a writer when I was like 14. You know what I mean? Gotcha. So, so, gotcha. so one of them is if you could sing for any band, past or present, for just one night, who would it be? Stone Temple Pilots. Why is that? Because I love Scott Wayland, and he was my friend. Mm-hmm. And um, I revered him so much. He is a talent that we've lost uh, 
that can never be replaced. He's an amazing human being and amazing talent. And I love the band and everybody that's in the band. And um, I think I could tear those songs up. I love that that's not what I was even expecting, by the way. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> <laughs> so what song do you always have to sing along with whenever you hear it? Like whether it be on the radio or on your iPod or whatever. A uh, baby shark. When it comes into Grandpa Shark, do, 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 I'm in. I'm in. <laughs> Forget it. That's so crazy. <laughs> <laughs> well, then maybe this will. Maybe this. Well, is that really the one that you love to sing along with? <laughs> <laughs> you can't help to sing along to that. It, it crushes you with the chorus. <laughs> it's all chorus. That's one of the greatest songs ever written. No, I'm just kidding. That's amazing. So, I mean, come on. It, it's got how many? One trillion views on YouTube? <laughs> oh, bro, trust me. There's been me. times where we walk into places and we'll just go, Baby Shark, did it, did it. people go, no, stop it. Stop. <laughs> Mark, so- damn it. Shit, now I'm going to be singing a stupid song all day. <laughs> and Lonnie would come up and go, Grandpa Shark, did he, did he, did he? <laughs> like a forget. <laughs> that is so funny, dude. Baby Shark. Oh, my God. <laughs> the only reason I even know what that is is I don't have kids, but my friends have kids, and I've had my friends say, if I have to yes. hear the fucking Baby Shark song one more time, I'm going to throw myself out of the oh, window. Oh, dude. You know? <laughs> That's a bad scene, man, that song. It's just, it's just like, what? You're kidding me. <laughs> oh, my gosh. This song's awful, but yet it's brilliant at the same time. Well, so I I totally expect a live cover of that complete with the baby shark dance okay so you know, oh you've... dude are you kidding me that stop it that would be, <laughs> be pushing buttons right there we already we we're already talking about getting in shark costumes and, and that'd be our opening song <laughs> i don't know man you could probably clear a room with that oh, man yeah. you know? i don't know dude what's going on with the bullet pigs well what happened i went to the show dude they came walking out in the shark outfits <laughs> singing baby shark with, to baby shark oh well, was it cool yeah, it was kind of rad. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, it kind of had a groove to it, man. You know. <laughs> well, what happened after that? The place went nuts. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> That's fucking great. <laughs> well, so I hope it's not the same answer for this one, but like, what song oh, makes shit. you always say, "I wish I wrote that song"? Oh my gosh! Wow, that's a really good question. Um, he, sometimes for me, it's the. Um, Live and Let Die from uh, Paul McCartney and Wings. Oh, yes. It's just like, man, that is still so rad, you know? Um, what's another one for me? Like, just like weird, like a weird song. Um, one could be Interstate Love Song. Some the, the lyrics, just, you can see it. The riff. I mean, you're in. It's just everything's a hook. When they go to the bridge, oh man, it's just so beautiful. It's incredible. It just opens up, and you know the sun shines. And there's clouds in the air, and I don't know. It just that song really moves me still. Um, Adele moves me when she sings. Um, Jennifer Hudson moves me when she sings. Uh, it's not necessarily the song. I think it's more the the artist, you know, or, or what the way what, what I'm feeling at the time, but. Right. Interstate Love Song would probably be one of those songs that you go like, God, I wish I wrote that song. Mm. You know? No, I, to- <laughs> I totally, yeah, I totally get that, man. But, I uh, play that on my acoustic guitar all the time just to play it because you know, the chords and the progression and, and the song's so simple but get complicated. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? In the same breath. Well, it's funny because it's like there's a difference <laughs> and between the complicated and complex. And begins, yeah. yeah. The melody is squat it gives me the chills every single time well i like what you were saying about how it's you know it's not complicated but you know it's simple but it's like i always think about this with certain songs is that to me there's a difference between complexity and being complicated yeah being complex to me just means that it's very unique and that there's not a whole lot that sounds like it, you know, where it's complicated. I mean, dream theater is complicated, but you know, dream theater can just be a million notes an hour, you know, whereas like, you know, like you said, interstate love song is not a very technically progressive song at all, but it moves you a lot more than something that would be technically, you know, 
proficient yeah. or whatever it would be. Right. It, and just the, the time and the sound of it, the way it was recorded, real, real drums. It's just all their music, Stone Temple with, with Scott was just like, wow. It was just at another, another level, um, such was um, Nirvana. Um, you know, that was where some of my, the Bleach record is probably one of my favorite records still to date. It's just something about that record that moves me. It's so funny to hear because I love hearing you say this because I feel like so many bands, especially from you know the era of uh, you know of, of Bullet Boys when especially when they came out you know going into the second and third album, like bands just kind of like just like, oh my god grunge killed us this that and the other but to hear you embracing it no. it's almost like I feel like you you not only accepted it but you appreciated it for its artistic oh my merit. Oh my gosh, all of them. I mean. Um, all the bands at that time that were coming up out of Seattle, my, our band, where we were constantly listening to that. I remember sitting in the back of the bus, bus with Jimmy DeAnda and listening to Bleach record over and over and over again. And people would come back and go, what the fuck are you guys listening to? <laughs> like, this is the shit. What are you talking about? Like, I mean, like, me and Jimmy with our eyes all big, like, wow, you, what are you talking about? You know, or, uh, uh, what's another band? Oh my gosh. Um, there, there were so many like really great underbelly bands, not not the big bands that were coming out, of course, like Pearl Jam and Soundgarden, but there was other bands. Mother Love Bone was one of my favorite bands. Um, that doesn't surprise that, me because Sundera. Andrew Wood definitely oh, reminded me. God, Andrew, like he could have, he could have, oh. he would, he could have been a star. He should have been a, he should have been a star, man. That's all he was doing. So it. beautiful and such a beautiful soul, that man. I, I, you know, here's the great thing about it. We we had chats back in the day, and he actually put on my uh, cut off turtleneck. I don't know if you ever saw him in pictures with that. I did. But he loved me so much that he started wearing the turtleneck. <laughs> he was a and big would, fan of 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 that oh genre. I mean, he loved Junkyard and he loved Bull Boys. Mm-hmm. He loved Circus of Power. He was a very yeah into like that kind of sleaze glam thing. You know, he always he was. was. Yeah. Stardog, all the—I mean, all of the music. Mother Mudbone was just like so cutting edge for me at the time, and he was, you know, Andrew was such a star to me. It's just like, wow, this kid's incredible, you know. And bands like that that were coming out of Seattle, and you know, uh, of course, all my legendary favorite punk rock bands that came from here from Los Angeles. Um, you know, just uh, it was a whole different time, a whole different era. You know, thank God that we were able to still flourish and do our thing uh, being you know dubbed as hair metal or whatever they call it and you know, people are calling it and we were able to come through and uh, to write music that was um, palatable and uh, that people that got it and that they knew that we weren't this no disrespect to anybody but we weren't Poison or Warrant or, or these bands that had these big huge hits that were ballads you know, we were straight jeans and t-shirt, whatever. Didn't have hairspray. You know, makeup was not our thing. Mm-hmm. You know, really. So, we were coming out. You know, and Tesla was a lot like us too. So we had, you know, still to this day, such a camaraderie between us two bands. It's like crazy. I just so, saw. I, I'm good friends with Jeff Keith. I just saw them hung out him. with Jeff this past weekend. <laughs> he's such a great guy, man. Oh gosh, he's such such huge heart like the size of he has a heart the size of Texas oh. he's such a good man <laughs> at least he really is he's an amazing guy oh my gosh we had it we took a picture me him and uh, me him and Millie from uh, who I love dearly uh, from Steelheart what a voice that guy's got oh, still so yeah we're, 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 we're three of us are hanging out and, and Millie wants me to sit and have a cognac and a, and a cigar with him in the boat I was like Fuck, man I'd love to do that but I have to go to do something else so I got the three of us for a picture and everybody's going Man, those the three of you guys are you fucking kidding me? <laughs> All three of you survived. You know, these, are my, these are my favorite soul singers on the boat. You know. <laughs> That's amazing. Well, I guess I guess for the, to like, kind of tie it all up, like so. Twenty twenty, man. Hopefully, is going to be the year of the bullet pig. Um, hey, I feel you. Are you going to tour? I mean, are we going to are we going to see oh, you here yes. in Atlanta again? Because I know you were just here not too long ago. But like, are we going to see? Like all four of the pigs 
in Atlanta? Oh, yeah. No, the, the, the Bullet Picks will definitely be in the ATL. We love the ATL. <laughs> Shout out to the ATL and our brothers and sisters out there. We're, we're coming. Uh, you will see all of our dates are coming up. we just been trying. We're getting more dates as we speak. Even today, the, the phones are blowing up over at our agents. And I, I'm not trying to say that, you know, I'm trying to say that with all humility. Um, but we are planning and some big plans uh, this year, definitely, we will be all over this country playing. And uh, if you if you can go to uh, our website, which is uh, bulletpointsofficial dot com, you can go and see all our dates um, and everything that w- we got going on. We're of course we're on IG, Twitter, Facebook, what have you. Uh, we're on all social medias, and we're, we're always on it. Uh, but we're really, really looking forward to bringing this show that we have and letting people see a band that is actually not from the past, but lives in the now and uh, can still do what they do. Man, I absolutely love that. And you know what? I am so looking forward to seeing that. And you know what? Talking to you, Mark, has just been a great experience. You're, you're, Aww, thank you, man. You too. You're an awesome guy and you're every bit as cool as I Aww. thought and hoped you'd be. And um, <clears throat> I can't oh, wait to you. see you guys here, man. Man, we can't wait to get to the ATL, my brother, for real. Well, thanks. But we will be there very soon. And please, uh, everybody, thank you so much for being all the love and the, the thousands of people that have sent us love on all of our social medias. We love you so hard. You have no idea how much the four of us love you. And thank you for for being so um, gregarious and loving to us for our reunion. It's a, it's a, you know, we kind of, when we came out with it, it I, I don't know if you saw it or not, but it just blanketed the internet everywhere. You couldn't get away from it. Oh yeah, no. So, I mean, I, a matter of fact, I was I was tweeting the day after it was announced, and, and I was like, "Oh my god, right. they liked my tweet." I was, I was like, "I was 15 again." Yes. you know, I was like, "Oh my no, god, totally, man." I, we're we're feeling the same way too. I mean, we're feeling like, "Wow," you know, it's like it, it's kind of weird sometimes. Like, um, we're very fortunate that we were signed. We were when we were young, very young. So that mentality kind of still stays with us. We were just talking about it last night. You, you still feel like you're, you know, 20, 21 years old, and you've got that magic, even though we're still older. We're a little mm-hmm. older now, but we still have that ability to do what we did at, in, in, the same, in the same breath that we did it, you know? Right. Our songs, the same performances. You know, we're very physical with our performances. <laughs> and... We're all in shape, ready to rock the house. So to me, it's just a complete blessing. Uh, I'm ecstatic about what we're doing right now. And our relationship between the four of us is probably the best it's ever been. And even though we, we come with, uh, in, in the rock and roll world, people think we come with some baggage and stuff like that. But that always makes a brilliant band. <laughs> man, it, 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 let me tell you, man. The, some of the best bands have some of the most baggage, man. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah, so man. You know, like, we're still dangerous, man. You know, we still we still live by the, the seat of our pants, and you know, we uh, we have that um, how would you say that savoir faire still that we have for the for this business, and that we want to do something really special that blows people away and go and people go like. Those damn bullet picks, man, they did it again. <laughs> <laughs> Dude, it's like, like New Orleans cockroaches, man. You can't kill them, you know? <laughs> man, I hate those guys, but I love them so much. You know? <laughs> it's like, I wish they'd go away. Damn, I'm glad they're back. So it's like... Yeah, you know. exactly. God, I wish they would have went away. Oh, God, I'm so glad they're back. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, fuck yeah, smooth up, bitch. But, uh, <laughs> so. Oh, yeah, hell yeah. <laughs> well, Mark, thank you so much for your time, man. I appreciate Aww. talking You're to you. You're very welcome. And you're incredible. And give my give my best and my love to the other guys. And can't wait to see you in Atlanta. I will for sure, brother. And thank you for, uh, for having me on your podcast. I podcast. I greatly appreciate it. And I had a blast with you, man. Well, I had a blast too. Thank you so much, man. And a real quick shout out. I want to uh, throw a quick shout out to my brothers, uh, Jimmy DeAnda, Nick Sweeta, and uh, Lonnie Vincent. Um, I love you guys with all my heart. And uh, I'm so glad that we are doing what we're doing. And uh, I can't wait to, till all of our fans and friends and family are able to hear some of this new music and see us on the road. Cheers!